Okay, well, wonderful. Um, thank you for hanging in there while we had some technical issues. Um, we, uh, we're going to talk about lots of different things today, but I, I think um, sometimes we just need to stop and think about what we do at our own facility. So as Becky said, I'm going to highlight a little bit of what we've done here at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and uh, then add in some new and upcoming uh, projects, highlight some uh, projects from other states as well. So um, first of all, we're going to talk about maternal telehealth programs. And so the objectives for today is uh, <clears throat> to just assess and see how obstetrics is used in, uh, or how telehealth is used in obstetrics and in the NICU. And then examine how mHealth is making an impact on our patients, uh, especially postpartum women. And then look at new tools that are um, are being used for um, mothers and neonates. And so the first program I want to talk about is ANGELS, and the oversight director for that is uh, my boss, Tina Benton, as well as my other boss, Dr. Curtis Lowry. And what they did was look at a way, how can we... Okay. Engaged and um, become a part of their health care and how can we uh, make health care accessible to them where they are at and um, in Arkansas and I'm sure in uh, a lot of the states where you reside we have a lot of rural areas a lot of small hospitals uh, some of our hospitals uh, here recently, they just look like a big oversized uh, trailer, you know, so they are, they're very small, not very many beds. Um, and so our whole premise with angels was where you live should not determine whether you live or die. So if you have a car wreck in small town Arkansas or small town Indiana or small town USA, you should be able to receive just the same quality care there as you would in an urban setting. And really, telehealth is the tool that we can use to help make that happen. And so, um, how ANGELS began, and um, our team loves to use mnemonics. ANGELS stands for Antenatal Neonatal Guidelines Education and Learning System. And so, Dr. Lowry, Tina Benton um, approached um, uh, Medicaid and uh, said, let's come up with a way to improve maternal and neonatal outcomes. And so they created ANGELS in 2002, and they leveraged federal dollars to increase access to care to everyone throughout Arkansas, no matter where they live. UAMS does provide the match, um, and so there's no state funding for ANGELS. So what has ANGELS done in the past 13 years? We have, through telemedicine, uh, been able to diagnose more high-risk mothers earlier in pregnancy. And as we know, with a lot of conditions, especially during pregnancy, the earlier you diagnose a problem, the more time the family, the physicians, the providers have to be able to develop an adequate plan of care. Um, and then the other thing uh, that's very important, so let's say we have a high-risk mother, we want her to deliver in the most appropriate facility. And so in this time, more preterm infants have born, been born in hospitals with neonatologists. And our neonat neonatology mortality rates have declined and mothers from rural areas are more likely to deliver high-risk, low-birth babies at UAMS or at other tertiary care centers. Now, UAMS is not the only game in town, but we are the only one, only academic health science center um, in, that does high-risk maternity care. There is another uh, facility in Little Rock, and we transport babies uh, and help with their patients just as well as ours and we have been uh, named as a leader or a model. And so uh, sort of talking about that, we have groups from uh, across the nation that come in and do a two-day site visit replicating our program. I know other programs uh, do this um, and then uh, they replicate their program. So angels, we don't make people name uh, their program after us, but there are many offshoots of angels in other states throughout the nation. 
So what we do is offer a community-based needs assist assessment uh, in services, and we provide education and training for providers, as well as a centralized tech support. So we feel like once you implement a te telemedicine program, you really need that centralized support. So if we are having an, a, uh, an issue where we need to use telemedicine at midnight on a Saturday night, we have the same tech support at that time as we would on a or Tuesday at noon. We also have a centralized call center that I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, very uh, vast telemedicine network and infrastructure that we've received and we also look at evaluation and quality improvement and then we also have evidence-based guidelines and protocols that we use for the patients uh, whether they be pregnant neonatal pediatric and we use these evidence-based guidelines so a little bit more on the call center and it, you know I guess uh, call centers were the first type of telemedicine used but our triage call center what they do is facilitate acute telemedicine and um, they help facilitate maternal and neonatal transports and they also communicate with providers and patients to help circle that loop so one of the things that um, with telemedicine if we see a patient by telemedicine We've got to close that loop back to the provider to let them know. And so we, uh, we also facilitate that through the call center. Um, if a patient in, uh, in a rural hospital needs to be transported, we'll, we'll arrange a helicopter or a plane or uh, whatever type of transport that they need, an ambulance, to get to the most appropriate hospital to deliver the baby. It, anybody, theoretically, can deliver a 24-week baby. It's do they have the resources and capabilities to care for that 24 weeker after delivery. And so it's much better. There's been multiple research studies that show if we transport the mother prior to delivery, the baby does much better. And um, Dr. Whithall has been a champion related to regionalization as well as Dr. Lowry. So our call center it, last year alone handled about 17,000 calls with um, about 600 of them being transport requests and that's the, uh, the rural hospital wanting to transport the pregnant patient to Little Rock and we actually transported about 550 of those. Um, there We do facilitate OB consults so let's say the physician has the resources and capabilities to take care of the patient in their rural town. They get to talk with a maternal fetal medicine doctor or another uh, physician here on staff and they help guide the management of the patient and the patient stays in the, uh, in the rural hospital. Then the other thing that our call center does is uh, re nurse triage calls. And so they're able to um, talk with a patient. Let's say um, she, uh, and I know I give this example because it's kind of unique. Let's say you're pregnant, you're hiking in the woods, and you're bit by a tick. You know, a lay public person, they're like, oh my gosh, am I going to get Lyme disease? What, what do I need to do? Do I need to go to the doctor? What's going on? And so they help facilitate those types of calls um, from the rare calls of, you know, being, being bit by a tick to uh, frequent calls of, you know, I'm contracting. Do I really need to come in or should I stay home? So they help facilitate those things and um, really provide expert advice to the patient. And um, we can either provide advice to them or we can send them immediately to labor and delivery or the emergency department. Or we can say, hey, we want you to be seen the next time the clinic's open. Um, and uh, so we don't necessarily send everyone to the emergency room or labor and delivery. And so... Um, the patients that we think we might need to send to labor and delivery um, or the ED if they're early on in pregnancy, we send them on to secondary triage. So with that, they are able to um, say, you know, your symptoms sound like X, Y, Z. Let me just call in a script for you. Or, you know, I really think this can wait till tomorrow. And so we've in avoided 1,500 urgent care visits last year just by providing that additional triage. And so average on month, a lot of our phone calls are just for information or follow-up. It's like, what do I do? Uh, because this is happening. Um, and then we do have about 50 maternal transports a month. 
So the other part of angels is telemedicine. And um, the first picture here is of Dr. Curtis Lowry, and he's a maternal fetal medicine physician. And Rosalind Perkins, she is the clinical director of angels. And um, she amazes me on how uh, she's able to facilitate this clinic. So as you can see, and I'll just use my uh, mouse here, um, she is seeing one, two, three, four, five different clinics simultaneously. So Roz is the navigator for this system. And so she will, and Dr. Lowry's in the picture just because we're taking a picture. Most of the time he is offsite at a different location. So Roz is at the helm. She knows all five clinics that are going on at the same time. She checks in with each clinic. There's a sonographer there if needed or a uh, genetics counselor. And so she brings providers in and out of the visit as they are needed and updates um, the team. So like here we have the sonographer and so we're able to see the, the, uh, the scan that is going on. We also have another uh, scan going on at another site. And one of these two sites is a genetic counselor. So at any one time during our high-risk telemedicine clinics, we have Roz connected. We have the site where the patient is connected with the sonographer. We have the genetics counselor who is located in a different location. And then we have the maternal fetal medicine uh, provider. So for any one high-risk telemedicine visit, we have four connections going on simultaneously. And then Roz has four clinics going on simultaneously. So it's, it's actually a wonder to watch these clinics as they are going, but it's a very good use of maternal fetal medicine specialty time. We have only five maternal fetal medicine specialists to cover the whole state of Arkansas. And, um, you know, we, we had a group come in from a western state uh, to look at um, our program, and they currently send a maternal fetal medicine doctor, a nurse, and a sonographer for four hours one way for a clinic each week. So that's a lot. I mean, that in that eight hours, that maternal fetal medicine physician could be seeing more patients uh, through telemedicine. And so that's what we, we just try to guide people on ways to um, increase um, uh, or be able to see more patients using technology. And so here's an example of all of our clinics. Now we don't we don't see patients in every one of these clinics every day. So we might have um, one clinic the first Monday of each month, just because there's not a whole lot of people living in some of these counties, and so there's not the need for a lot of high risk OB consults. So depending on uh, on the numbers of patients is how often we have clinic there, but we do see patients in all of these clinics at least monthly and we have our telemedicine clinic going on um, eight to five um, Monday through Friday except for Wednesday mornings we don't have clinic but all the other days we we're seeing patients okay so the next thing um, that I'm just going to show you is, you know, in 2002 is when Angels was created. In 2003 is when we started seeing telemedicine patients. And just, as you can see from the graph, we saw about 200 that year. And so we've had a steady increase each year. And so now we're about at 500 a year, topping off on the telemedicine visits that we do. And so you may say, oh, well, you know, all of those patients that you're seeing by telemedicine would have drove to Little Rock or been seen. But what we found is our face-to-face -face clinic, which is in the blue, the local genetics clinic, has remained steady or even increased, whereas we're seeing um, patients in the telemedicine clinic almost equal to our local genetics clinic. So that just shows that people who were not having access to maternal fetal medicine or genetics counseling are being able to have this resource now that we're available. And we're not just seeing all the patients that we would have seen face to face in the genetics clinic. So that, that shows that telemedicine is reaching the people who, who really need the consults. 
in addition to our high-risk OB clinic, we have an infectious disease clinic. So we have an HIV specialist, and he sees patients through telemedicine and uh, consults with their provider. And we have it uh, in multiple different models for our clinics. Some of our clinics, it's strictly just um, our providers, our ANGELS providers, but the infectious disease clinic, it's more of a, a mixed model where you have the provider in the room with the uh, provider by telemedicine. So both of them are seeing the patient at the same time. So they're all on the same page. The other thing that we do is uh, provide testing at rural sites, so non-stress testing. We, we do that by telemedicine. OB psychiatry is a, a, a very much a need in Arkansas, so we see quite a few patients through that. Um, the other um, type of service that we provide, and I didn't put any pictures on this, is fetal echo. And so let's say a, a mom, uh, during her initial scan, um, the baby's heart didn't look quite right. We send a sonographer that is specialized in doing fetal echoes to the rural site or the rural telemedicine clinic, and then a um, cardiologist from Arkansas Children's Hospital reads all of those scans. And then they develop a plan of care if needed from those uh, visits. High risk OB clinic, we saw about 632. And in some of our clinics with the, the health departments in Arkansas, we have the, the mixed method as well, whereas a nurse practitioner from the health department remains in the clinic while the patient's being seen. And our doctors and nurse practitioners help manage um, the patient uh, remotely. And then some uh, facilities just don't have level two ultrasound support. And so we send a sonographer there and then our uh, physicians read the, um, the ultrasounds here. And uh, sort of a, a, a program that we've had for about four years is colposcopy. And so with that, we see about um, 632. So we have a nurse at the site and the physician helps direct um, the biopsies and things for that. Um, let's say we do see an abnormal heart scan uh, using the fetal echo. We have a program where we uh, connect with um, the surgeon that will take care of the baby, the OB provider, the MFM, the nurse case manager, genetics counseling, and they all work together to coordinate care for this pregnant mom and facilitate delivery at the appropriate site um, surgery at the appropriate time and so that is all done um, through interactive video and even uh, after the baby's born and um, surgery's done they they follow the loop or close the loop back together uh, to make sure adequate um, you know the baby was taken care of adequately and the mother was diagnosed uh, correctly through um, this program. And so uh, it also helps um, with not every baby with an anomaly needs to be delivered at UAMS. Let's say we determine it's, it's a cleft palate that the baby probably will be able to, to feed and do well at, um, at a uh, different facility. We help facilitate delivery at their local hospital. So, um, so we admitted 341 cases and had 161 deli live deliveries here at UAMS. Telenursery, and this is a, a little bit different program, and this is what began in 2008, and uh, Dr. Whit Hall and Shannon Lewis, who is a nurse, especially uh, care nurse with our NICU, three times a week, they connect with all of these sites, and what they do is check in to see how many patients they have, um, if they're having any issues with their patients, if they need any consultation or support. So let's say they've got a baby there that they think, oh, you know, this baby does not look quite right. Um, can we get a geneticist or a uh, pediatric? Um, geneticist in to look at the baby and so that we will help facilitate a genetics consult via te via telemedicine and so we have 25 sites throughout Arkansas and one in Texas and um, the hospitals in Texarkana are all on the Texas side so that's why we have the Texas side. And here's an example of Shannon Lewis, who's a specialty nurse and Dr. Hall and they're connecting all, all to these sites um, 
So just in 2014, they had 142 virtual rounds with all of these uh, sites and provided 12 consults on babies. And um, the other thing that we believe strongly in is if a baby delivers at UAMS, it does not necessarily mean that the baby has to remain here until it's discharged home. If we can, we like to back transport the baby to a hospital closer to where the mother lives. So let's say the mother lives um, near a level one or level two nursery. Once the baby's at that appropriate medical level, we will help facilitate back transport to the rural hospital. The other um, uh, uh, service that we provide is Mother Baby Connections, and that's where we have the mother tuning in um, to her baby, let's say it's at Arkansas Children's Hospital, and so they can uh, talk with the physicians, the nurses there, as well as see their baby. Uh, the main purpose of that is, is um, uh, talking with the healthcare team through interactive video. Okay, and briefly, the ANGELS guidelines is what we've developed to, um, to uh, I guess, facilitate best practices in Arkansas. We have about 203 evidence-based practice guidelines in obstetrics, neonatal, and pediatrics. And um, so, like an example that I like to use for this, let's say you've got a patient who's ex uh, a pregnant woman. She was exposed to parvovirus, and you know, those labs that I need to draw on that pregnant woman just don't readily come to mind. I can look very quickly on the evidence-based guidelines at the angelsguidelines.com uh, and know exactly what labs I need to order for that patient. So just facilitating the best type of care. And let's say, for example, we have a patient with HIV, they delivered, or they're going to deliver their baby in Arkansas. We have the infectious disease HIV specialist that can help with the management of the mother's care, as well as the phone number for the neonatal pediatric specialist to facilitate with HIV care for the baby. So what we've done, uh, or just a brief summary of ANGEL's impact, we've increased maternal transports to the appropriate hospital, not always to UAMS. We've increased newborn survival, and we also help providers in those rural sites or distant sites using technologies and guidelines. And overall, maternal fetal consults are up, and I think appropriate consults are up, because these women were not able to drive three hours to come to Little Rock for the consult. And so, um, just sort of in summary of angels in our program, what we've done is create a model where we can replicate it and do multiple other things. So we have telehealth stroke, we have HIV care, we have adult sickle cell, we have M health projects, we have hand trauma, we have spinal cord injury patients being seen by telemedicine. So with all of this, uh, I sort of consider us a think tank. So once we've developed a good working model, we replicate it with other, other types of care. Here's another program that we use. It facilitates uh, or uses the Angels Call Center. Is we had a quite a few patients that were not, uh, they were pregnant, not quite sick enough to remain in the hospital until delivery. But let's say they live three hours away and their baby had an anomaly or they had a high risk condition where they just did not need to travel three hours away from their delivering facility. What we do is partnered with a hotel in town and um, the patients stay there. We have food delivered to their hospital. The nurse, nurses in the call center call them once a day. Uh, monitor their vital signs, and then they're seen in the prenatal clinic. Another program that we have that has developed from ANGELS is a retinal CAM project. And so a lot of times uh, babies who've been hospitalized in the NICU, um, the main factor for them getting to go home is if they are seen by pediatric um, uh, ophthalmologist. And so, uh, because retinal screening is very important, especially in babies that are born very early. And so, these babies, uh, because there are not very many pediatric or neonatal ophthalmologists, they would have to remain in the hospital. So, what we've done is facilitate by putting retinal camera equipment at at a site in Arkansas, and so the physician can perform the retinal exams 
at the remote site. And sorry for the blurry pictures there. But we, we did see 26 babies this last year at the rural site. And so that just helps save um, dollars if babies are just staying because that they're lacking this one type of visit. Other models for telemedicine, I was at the AWAN convention, which is Association of Women's Health Obstetrical and Neonatal Nurses, and I was at, at that convention in Long Beach in California, and I had the opportunity to talk with these ladies who are in Portland, Oregon, and they're using um, telemedicine to help facilitate neonatal resuscitation. And um, every, every nurse that works um, is trained in RP if they're in maternal infant division. But let's say you do one code a year versus daily codes, and I think volume has a lot to do with it. We are learn, uh, we learn the skill, it's just like CPR. We all go through CPR training to, uh, every two years. So NRP is every two years, so we're all taught that training. But the people who do it more often have just a little bit more skill than the ones who maybe do it once a year or once every two years. So the, this hospital has uh, partnered with their com other community hospitals to provide interactive video support to those hospitals. So as a code is going on, they're able to join in and the nurses at um, Legacy Health in Portland are able to help guide those nurses and other healthcare providers during the code. In their findings, they had 100 telebaby events, which uh, which is about 2% of the deliveries in their catchment area. So that um, they're able to be there for the nurses and the healthcare team when they really need them. And I just really thought this is an innovative program. And I've got their information down there at, at the bottom um, of the slide. Other things that we do, we help coordinate care uh, of uh, children inpatient. Um, we also provide specialty consults outpatients. We have a pediatric geneticist and genetics counselor that he sees patients in Kansas almost uh, or weekly, I know for sure. And this next week we will have a group of genetics counselors and pediatric geneticists in um, coming to our training center to learn how to use telemedicine in their practice to help facilitate care for patients statewide in their area. I think home-based telehealth is really going to be um, uh, the new and emerging area. Emergency consults, as I said before, and then resuscitation support is very important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about current research initiatives, and I won't spend a whole lot on the stats, but we have a, um, a uh, web camera program that was created here by clinicians, and we were able to um, uh, partner with uh, Manu equipment manufacturing companies and then originally with our IT people here at UAMS to develop a web camera. And so this web camera fits on an isolate um, and you may say, well, you know, doesn't the mother stay in the room all the time with the baby? And we do have the luxury of having uh, all private rooms in our 64 bed NICU, but let's say a mother only has 12 weeks of maternity leave and she wants to spend the leave once her baby comes back home. She can join in and view the baby by the web camera. Or let's say the dad has to go back to work. Back to work. He, can, he can see the baby by the web camera. They can also give the um, access to friends, family, grandparents, um, as well as others uh, to see the baby. And it's a very high resolution camera. And so uh, a lot of our NICUs are kept very dark. And so you can still see the baby in the dark. And it also has audio. So the mom or dad can talk, sing, or read to the baby. And so this has a nationwide impact. And so I always tell the story. They were, uh, they were from Maine and uh, just a really neat, uh, neat couple. They were traveling from Maine to, um, uh, to Texas. And so they had made it back to Texarkana, which is right on the Texas-Arkansas border and she went into preterm labor. 
And uh, so Texarkana used the Angels Call Center, facilitated her transport to, uh, to Little Rock, and so she subsequently delivered a preterm baby. Well, they were our first couple to use uh, the Angel Eye cameras after we, um, after we redesigned the hardware and the software. And so in the right-hand corner is, is grandmother, and then the left-hand corner is new uncle to the baby. And so they were, these family members from Maine, they did not have the, the money or the, well, the resources to, you know, just up and travel to Arkansas to see their new, uh, newest addition to the family. And so um, the baby was stayed here until it was stable enough to transport or back transport to Maine. Uh, but the web camera was much uh, a very important aspect of their, um, of their stay. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about a study that I've done with the cameras. Yeah, well, I won't talk much about it. Let's see. Uh, I do recruit all online. I wanted to use women who had used the cameras and dads who'd used the cameras. I looked at stress, anxiety, and bonding. One thing, uh, just one thing that I want to point out, the number of logons with mothers versus the number of logons with fathers was um, the same. And so moms and dads use this virtual technology to join in to see their baby uh, just the same. And you may say, well, what's the big deal about that? We know that in-house, in the NICU, uh, when a baby's inpatient, the dad, due to multiple reasons, can't visit as often or stay as long. But virtually, they do visit as, as long and they do uh, visit as often. Now, when it comes to uh, parents, they still want to be with their baby to bond, but um, it does give them the opportunity to see their baby and provide another level of reassurance. They do say it overall has a positive impact on their stress and anxiety. They can watch their baby from work or home, and, and there's uh, a, a couple there that had uh, their baby hospitalized. And of course, they'd rather be there in person, but it, this gave them the additional reassurance. So a lot of times mothers or fathers will call the nursery to check on their baby, see how the baby's doing. They uh, Then they said they would log on to the Angel Eye camera to make sure the baby uh, and the status is what the nurse had said. Uh, so just the cameras provide another another part of reassurance. So the qualitative data supported the quantitative data between the web camera viewing and the parental stressor scale, and fathers utilize the web cameras to view the baby. And so it's really a component of family-centered care. Um, clinical implications that we need to think about when you're installing the web camera. I, I believe nurses or NICU staff need to be involved in the decision-making process, be involved in writing protocols, uh, in developing the teaching materials for um, the, uh, the patients. We need to have enhanced teaching for family members who use web cameras because they need to know, you know, when it's okay to call, um, Please let us know if XYZ is happening. Let them know if the camera is turned off, that it does not necessarily mean a bad thing is happening with your baby. That is the greatest amount of stress is when a family member logs on and there's a black screen. Their mind jumps immediately to my baby's having a code and dying. So it's important for um, the enhanced teaching to happen and empower the patient. If they see their baby in an uncomfortable position or crying, um, have them call and talk with the, the nursery staff. And then as the NICU staff, we always need to think twice before removing the camera. And one family member told me her story of, you know, I'm traveling back and forth from my home to care for the other children that I have. And, you know, I've just not ever seen my baby get a bath. Well, I logged on to Angel Eye the other night or the web camera the other night, and I saw my baby get a bath for the first time. And she said, no, that wasn't the first bath that he had, but it was the first bath that I saw he had. And so that um, just was really profound uh, to her. So really think twice about removing the camera and keep it on as much as possible. I will say my pilot study was very small. I'm trying to get money for uh, larger studies. 
but we did look at usage, just overall usage of the web cameras. We started in 2011 with a, a few web cameras after the redesign. We had 45 family members, and now we're up to about 200 family members that use a camera, and so they can share the username and uh, access with other family members. So we had about 600 or you know, 550 people use the camera last year and we have a steady number of 26 cameras. And so one of our big questions, and this is not really research, this is just more of a satisfaction survey. You know, we wanted to know, did they call tech support a lot? Over half of them said they never called tech support. Um, another thing that people say, oh, well, if they use the camera, they won't come see their babies often. And 73% said they visited the same as if they would have the camera not been there. It just provides that other level of reassurance. And 60% um, said it actually did reduce the number of calls that they did to the NICU. Okay, moving on. I know we've just got a, uh, about 10 minutes left, so I want to move quickly through this other study. We are dab dabbling in postpartum uh, in health. And so we're looking at all different types of uh, monitoring with them. We chose postpartum because these women have to go back uh, very quickly after delivery, one week, two weeks. And really, once they're discharged from the hospital, there's no way for us to monitor their blood pressure. It is a hypertensive disorder in pregnancy in that it's resolved by delivery. And um, about uh, eight weeks to two months after delivery, they, sh they should no longer have hypertensive issues unless they subsequently develop chronic hypertension. So a lot of these women have to stay in the hospital until their blood pressure is stabilized. So what we do is there's my research uh, associate, Christian Lynch, and um, for the program, we make sure the patient has a phone, a working phone, and meet certain social conditions like um, we would not enroll a person in, in health, let's say, that did not have any prenatal care or, um, uh, or did not have uh, electricity or, you know, certain issues. I know those patients are desperately in need, but uh, if they don't have the resources, we, we do not enroll them. And then they have to sign a clinical agreement. What we do is train them how to use the equipment while they're in the hospital. Um, and for 24 hours, they take their blood pressure as uh, the same time the, uh, the techs in the hospital take their blood pressure. And then we provide them with detailed instructions. And so this is an example of the software. So the call center nurse is alerted when a reading is out of range. And so we worked very closely with our maternal fetal medicine physicians who are over this program to say, well, what exactly is the out of range blood pressure that we would want a call for or um, out of range weight or pulse ox? What do we need to call you about? And so the call center nurse, before she calls the physicians, calls the patient, uh, patient and says, you know, what was going on when you took Took your blood pressure, do you need to sit down, rest, let's talk a few minutes, and then let's go ahead and take your blood pressure again. So she sort of triages the situation. If, if she's got a crying two-year-old and she's worried about cooking dinner and she's very upset at that time, we wouldn't retake her blood pressure at that time. We'd kind of talk her down and let her retake it later. And let's say it's still high after they talk to her, then we communicate with the provider and decide what's the next step for this patient. And so I did get a research study for that, for this, and it began in uh, December 2014, and we only have six more patients to enroll, so I'm happy uh, to talk about that and um, with, with someone who wants to talk about it later. But we want to look at why, um, uh, why do some people choose not to use the M-Health equipment? So I'm working with a researcher at University of Arkansas Fayetteville, the Walton School of Business, who really looks at um, the business aspects of healthcare tools and things. And so we want to look at, well, why would a person not choose to be monitored? Um, why are patients dropping out of the M-Health monitoring? And then looking at their perspectives and then look at, you know, did this really decrease hospital costs? Did it decrease emergency room visits, hospitalization, perceived stress and anxiety, and then length of stay? 
and then just for the heck of it, we're looking at, you know, there's really not any studies looking at the normal cause of, um, course of blood pressure weight and pulse socks in postpartum women who have preeclampsia. And so I won't talk so much about that, but here's an example of our equipment. So this is the pulse ox, and here's the scale with one of our patients, and they do that, um, the scale and pulse ox once a day and the blood pressure twice a day. And um, there's a software so she can look at all the patients being monitored at the same time. There's a picture of the blood pressure cuff, and... Um, so we have patients, they answer a survey prior to enrolling, and then after completing the study, they answer another survey, and we have a qualitative study going on simultaneously. So the survey questions are related to technology. You know, what did they feel about using this technology? Their health behaviors, you know, how empowered are they in making health decisions for themselves and uh, perception of how they care for their health. Um, we have had issues. As with any other pilot study, um, a lot of our patients that we deliver at UAMS um, do have um, social uh, uh, or financial issues, and so a lot of them do receive um, government phones where they have a government cell phone, and so they only get an allotted number of minutes. Well, you know, they can really want to spend uh, all their minutes talking with the call center um, each week or each month. Um, uh, problem solving issues. So what we did is facilitate a phone in the call center where we can text back and forth because texting does not impact the minutes that they have on their phone. Plus, a lot of times the younger generation is much uh, more apt to um, answer a text versus a phone call. And so contacting subjects, we've been able to do that very well once we implemented the texting. Um, we did have uh, one patient that um, lived on the other side of a mountain, and so her readings were not picking up, but when she drove up um, uh, to a friend's house, the readings would then download. Um, another thing that we didn't really account for or think about before the study, I mean, it, it, many of them have neonates in the NICU because they are preeclamptic, and so they have the equipment in the NICU uh, while their baby is there. And uh, we are having issues with the blood pressure cuff for patients who are um, a little bit on the obese side or that have an unusually shaped arm. And we call those cone-shaped arms, you know, where the fat is not distributed uh, evenly. And so we are having problems with that. And so that's just a brief uh, study. It is funded through our Translational Research Institute. I want to talk about another study that Dr. Whit Hall is doing with um, folks here at UAMS. And what he is doing is teaching residents um, how to recognize um, the infrastructure for um, intubating a very small neonate um, in a time-effective manner. Um, with this, he uses a video laryngoscope, and so he is able to direct the care of the residents. And let's see if I can find a, a picture. Um, so, uh, well, I'll just move on to the study. There are 72 pediatric and medical pediatric residents. They were randomized to an intervention to a non-intervention group. So the intervention group, they used tele-video uh, with the laryngoscope that had the video camera, and they assisted them on, um, uh, on intubation care. They all received the standard NRP training. They all filled out a pre-survey, and they all completed a post-test. So here is a, an example of a video laryngoscope. Scope. And so um, they were able to, to use that, and uh, Dr. Hall or one of the other neonatologists was able to say, you know, move back a little bit, you know, go to the left, go to the right. I'm not a neonatologist, but, um, but able to give them instruction. And there's Dr. Hall with one of the residents there, and they are doing it, of course, on a mannequin. And so conclusions were that this hands-on intubation training can be used to improve intubation skills in pediatric residents that are retained for up to one year. So this training using technology and these tools helps impact their care as a provider later on. Um, 
So we would love, and probably the next phase Dr. Hall will do, is this type of technology can be adapted to help community physicians needing training or hands-on assistance with intubation. So building on that program that's happening, happening in Oregon, if they built in a video laryngoscope, they could even help guide the intubation uh, as well as uh, the other aspects. So I think that's just uh, a new and upcoming thing. Okay, so briefly, I'm going to talk about what's new on the horizon, and I was able to talk, well, actually, for quite a long time with a digital footprinting company, and um, they actually have a very novel product. So, what they do is, um, there is one vendor for this current uh for, for this currently, they give the hospital uh, the software and the equipment needed uh, to do digital footprinting, and then they just charge on a per baby basis. So if you only have um, 10 babies deliver at your facility, you're only charged for those 10 babies. If you have 300 babies delivered that month, you're charged 300 uh, for those 300 deliveries. So there's no upfront cost for equipment or software. So what they do is place the baby's foot on, on the pad and it scans it and they do both feet and the mom can go in at a later date and download um, their birth certificate with the footprints and add, you know, fancy little borders and things. The other aspect of this, it can be kept um, by the parent as a, um, a way to track their baby's foot or handprint. Um, because, you know, even though we, we don't want to think about things like that, but, you know, children are, um, are kidnapped every day. And so this is another way that parents can have access to their baby's footprint. And so the software will remain uh, where the parents can log in and get their baby's um, footprint indefinitely. And so I had a... Um, I really thought this was a novel concept, and, and it's, uh, I think, uh, a very good idea. Okay, here's another thing that's going on is digital, um, let's see if this will play. The Smith family isn't able to be here today. However, Dr. Hall is able to create continuity in his communication with the family by utilizing in July's virtual rounding system. When that family may not be physically present, Virtual rounding is a new optional feature offered by AngelEye. Utilizing Google Glass, other smart glasses, or even a tablet or smartphone, a clinician can record a virtual rounding session with just a few easy steps. First, the clinician logs into the system. Next, the clinician identifies which bed or camera he is rounding on. Then he's able to simply record a video message for the family. Uh, Ms. Hayes, good morning. This is Dr. Hall. Hopefully your baby will be on room air in the next 12 hours or so. Do you have any questions? Once the clinician clicks send a parent account, the system does the rest. The doctor can now go on to the next patient, having created continuity with the communication and relationship with the previous neonate's parents. The primary account holder, most often the neonate's parents, can securely log on to AngelEye at any time on a PC, tablet, or smartphone. In addition to viewing and speaking to their neonate, they can now view the virtual rounding session left by Dr. Hall. The clinician and parent both greatly benefit from the simplicity of AngelEye's virtual rounding system. Thank you so much for your video message. I had a question about what you meant by flow rates. Sure, that's a really good question. Uh, babies are supported from a respiratory standpoint by the flow, which is, goes into the nasal canyon. It's right underneath your baby's nose. Great, thank you. I appreciate your message. I wish you had something like this one mom here in ICU last year. I'm glad we could have this technology. Hope that makes it better. Thank you. Angelized virtual routing. Okay. And um, we are going to oh my goodness. So the next uh, patients that we're going to start doing this on is pregnant women that are in the hospital. And so how many times have we had a patient in the hospital? I know that was a nursery example, but how many patients have we had or uh, family members that we've had in the hospital and, you know, we go to get the cup of coffee down the hall while the physician rounds, right, when we're um, down the hall to get coffee. And so what we're going to do is implement this in our inpatient use unit so um, 
patients, no matter who they are, if they grant access to family members, they can hear the virtual rounding session. So it's a good way to keep people informed using, uh, you know, patient and family centered care uh, techniques because, um, like, for example, I'm giving the, uh, my mother's in a nursing home. And so she has a care session um, or care plan meeting tomorrow afternoon. I don't know that I'm going to be able to be there, but I sure would love to have it recorded so I could go back and, and listen to it. So I think this is a, a, a thing that may be used in the future just to help with communication. And we have technology, so we should be able to use the tools. Another thing is uh, home monitoring during pregnancy. So using... Um, cost-effective technology to you to provide NSDs. I know, um, I think in the future, you know, we kind of came up with uh, pregnant women, you know, going to the doctor every month and then every two weeks and then every week and, you know, uh, but there's no really evidence behind that. So it could be that sometimes we can use technology to supplement some of those visits where the patient doesn't have to come in and wait in the in the doctor's office to be seen. We can use telemedicine uh, to see those patients. And so I know this was a lot of information, and um, but I am willing to stay on for questions if, if you are, and um, I'll, I'll try to answer them as best as I can. And if you ever want to come for a visit here, we can help facilitate a visit. We've had several, or, you know, about every month we have two to three people from other um, states or countries come and visit and see how we do our ANGELS model.